we're here to tell you to, to help you get past that initial hurdle and succeed in your goals. Now, uh, we're going to do something a little weird today. Um, if you're recording, you can stay where you're at. But um, if you are, we're going to take a head count. If you're actually considering a rewrite or in the middle of a rewrite, go ahead and sidle over to Cyberpunk. And if you're just here for fun and curiosity, go to Solarpunk. Cyberpunk is people who are doing rewrites. Solarpunk is people who are not. Yeah. Well, that's not bad. Uh, I'm up at 60% now. Hopefully that helps. Um, yeah. I would rather see what I'm seeing, which is most most people are not doing rewrites. It means you're happy with your code. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. OK, moving right along. So. First things first, rewrites can be very disruptive and sometimes even counterproductive. Uh, if you can avoid a rewrite, don't do it. It's a lot harder to read code than write it. All code's going to look uglier six months from now. It's just how it is. And it can be a little unpleasant looking at your past self a lot like hearing your voice recorded. It might not actually be as bad as it looks to you. To help kind of get a, a barometer of that, find an author you respect. Ask them if they'll do a code review. Often this can improve a code base dramatically in a short period of time. This takes a little courage. But a lot of the more experienced coders are going to feel honored by the request. <laughs> okay, my <laughs> line mix in qualification. Uh, please save your questions for the end. Um, so a good thing to ask yourself is, can incremental upgrades improve the code base? Try making each part of the code easier to read every time you touch it. The point where you can no longer avoid a rewrite is going to be when you can't honor a feature request that you want to do or solve an issue that you want to solve. My uh, slides are broken. Slides are broken? Um, it should work. Can you try again? Yep, slides are broken. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, give it a sec. Oh. Oh, that's some slides. Oh. Uh, there it goes. Uh, that. OK, we should be good. OK, you want to talk about first steps? Uh, yeah. Um, planning is probably the most important step in a rewrite. If you don't have a concrete plan, you'll fall into the same trap that caused the rewrite. So like, um,
to start the rewrite, you need to have a good outline. You should clearly list out everything you need so you can easily reference it. It should look like a code cookbook listing out everything you need, how they go together. I could go book later steps should build off the earlier ones. You should only list things you need. Envision what you see success as. Break it down into separate small tasks, steps that need to be taken to be completed. Tools like Trello can help with organization as you can better lay out your goals. It's really important at this step to forgive yourself for whatever you've written. You know better now, and that means you, in the past, have the ability to grow and get better. Good job. You can fight code clutter, or you can fight yourself. You can't do both. If you need to step away for a while to get in a good headspace and make the work sustainable, do it. The code will still be here tomorrow. Like it said, the, it's also important to know what success is going to be. I've seen a number of rewrites stretch on forever because the requirements change or the authors are still not happy with the code. It's me. I'm still not happy with the code. Or it's just unclear when rewriting stops and maintaining begins again. Or you just forget steps that would make your life a thousand percent easier down the road. So before you start writing code, figure out what your requirements for success are plan doesn't survive the first contact with the enemy. You're going to flex that plan hard, but never forget what victory means to you and flex your plan accordingly. Um, um, avoiding cluttered, clo cluttered code is the biggest factor in maintenance it can be the life or death of a project and it can do contributors from your project so what exactly is cluttered code um we're gonna loosely define cluttered code as code that's hard to follow like poor names recursion or other things not everything can not everyone can agree on a definition, so we're gonna go with the bare minimum. A uh, tell of cluttered code can be having a lot going on in a small area. If you have a function that does a lot of things like, oh, it checks the database for something, then sends a change to a different part of the database, that's not good if they're unrelated. Um, a function should be small, like a haiku. Uh, small, readable, and does a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, poor naming is also a contributing factor. Have you ever seen a variable named a single letter? Let single letter and struggled to figure out its usage. It's hard to find meaning in something with a meaningless name. Uh, names should never do things other than what they say. This is seen often in code bases that have changed a lot. You should put in the effort of changing the name when necessary, as it relieves the burden later down the line. In Generics, you should, in generics, you should name your arguments like you'd name types, because that's how they're used. You wouldn't make a type a single letter, so why generics? Uh, um, on the topic of types, prefixing type names doesn't give any more information than what the name would be otherwise. You shouldn't type your names. Context should give that away. Recursion should be avoided. Should, 
as much as possible, it gets very difficult to understand and it can also cause your stack to overflow. Oftentimes, you can rewrite recursive functions in a non-recursive way, generally making it more readable. Um, excessive nesting should also be avoided. You can use early return patterns that return when there's conditions you don't want rather than checking for the conditions you do want. Nested loops can often be extracted into their own functions as well. Interesting. I have a desync between the slides and the monitors. Oh boy. <laughs> we are here. Here we are. Here. Okay. Okay. Is that right? Yep. No, that's perfect. Okay. So some things just can't be fixed in place. ID refactors have tools for a lot of problems. Rename a class, IDE refactor. Rename generic type parameters, IDE refactor. Extract part of a method into its own new method, IDE refactor. A lot more stuff can be fixed in place. Invert conditions and early out to reduce nesting, refactor. Turn a recursive function into a work queue, refactor. Big method bogging you down, refactor. But some things you just can't. Time coupling, uh, if, if things are named poorly in a way that implicates separation of concerns or program structure, if you have data-centric code but the schemas don't really fit, uh, excessive cleverness, and most importantly, just if you run into player issues, like a GitHub issue in your issue tracker, and you want to solve it but you can't, that's a sign that your code may unfortunately need a rewrite. So we're going to talk about some bigger hammers to hit your code with. This is not a mnemonic. I have to look up the names every single time I use this acronym. It's old and infuriating, and it makes really good code. Talking about solid. Single responsibility is also known as separation of concerns. A great example comes from a GitHub repo called Solid by Howard Diner. I'll put that in the links at the end. The example is bird classes. You could have a type hierarchy. You write a bird class, and maybe an eagle, and a sparrow subclass, and maybe bird has a fly method, and a molt method, and all the birds can either use the basic version or uh, expand on it, but call super, or override it completely and do something else. So far, so good. We've got good bird stuff happening. But then we have penguins. Penguins can't fly. <laughs> so we throw an unsupported operation exception. If you find yourself doing this, you probably run afoul of the single responsibility principle. Another tell is when you go to modify a class and you need to also go modify other classes. There should only be one reason you modify a class because something about its responsibility has changed. The open closed principle. Don't remove API. Objects should be closed for modification, but open for extension. 
I'm not that draconian about this in implementation classes, but it matters a lot when you have an API package and other people have to interact with your code in a well-defined way. You can add objects and methods, but take a minute as you do because you don't ever want to remove the API when you add it. Liskov substitution. Anytime you accept an object in a method, you should accept a subclass. This is another tight coupling issue. The reason you might not accept a subclass is because you're reaching into implementation details of the class you're using. This is one of those fundamental object-oriented ideas. Your objects should encapsulate their details and nobody should be able to reach in and twist internal mobs. The only thing on the surface of the cell is API. Interface segregation. I told you the, these would be hard to remember. Don't make people interfa implement interfaces they don't use. Think sided inventory for non-sided inventories, Mojang. <sighs> Seriously, like the flightless bird example above, this can be a single responsibility or separation of concerns issue. Consider whether is a relationships can be reformulated into has a relationships and compose your objects out of traits whenever possible. A bird has the ability to fly, maybe. A bird has the ability to molt and grow new feathers. Maybe instead of having methods, it could provide capability objects that give access to just those specific traits instead. Dependency inversion principle. This is a weird one. Basically, you draw a line between your high level, quote, business logic and the implementations of everything like think bucket and craft bucket. Don't cross the line. General overview code should not be detail aware. This is probably hardest to learn and work with, and it's probably the most contentious idea presented here, but it can separate important parts of your mod from, let's say, Minecraft details that can force drastic and unpleasant changes to it. Don't go too solid. I'm also going to link this. This is Enterprise FizzBuzz, and it's horrifying. It's the most solid code I have ever seen, and it is horrifying. There's definitely such a thing as too far on every single one of these points. The next acronym is ACID, which is a good mnemonic. Uh, it's important for anything transactional. So for simplicity's sake, we're going to talk about a project bench, where some items are shown from the inside of the bench GUI. Item transfer is extremely transactional. Uh, atomicity when you pick up an item stack, you should never see the partial project pro progress. Like you get the name, but not the count or something like that. Either the whole item stack was picked up or none of the item stack was picked up. At any time a change is made, both sides of the transaction should be in a consistent state. For instance, the item transfer should only result any of the required mark dirty calls being made as part of the transaction uh, because otherwise the call was not consistent. I don't know how many of you play the forest, but if you get one person to put a log into a log holder and pick it up repeatedly, a second person comes in and tries to grab the log the instant it gets put down. You can do blocks. This is an isolation failure. 
every person picking up and putting down the logs should be handled in some order. The order doesn't matter as long as exactly one person gets a log, no matter how many people are clicking on it. And the last one, durability. Uh, full 100% durability is a giant myth, but if you crash the server while picking up an item, then when you start the game up again, that either should be in your hand or in the inventory. Neither means you destroyed an item, which isn't good, and both means you duped an item, which also isn't good. Setting an item stack reference is effectively a tonic on most systems, so you can just get reasonable durability at a very low cost just by making sure to copy and modify the copy. And that about wraps it up. Um, so let's go for questions. What are you talking about? Mongo is great for certain kinds of data. MongoDB is nice. I use it for my Discord bot. Anonymous asks, what did the C stand for? C in ACID was for consistency. Um, basically, anytime you make a, a change in your transaction, it should leave everything in a proper state. Can whoever's on the stage get off the stage? <laughs> I've got one of those. Um, Merchant Pug asks, when is it ideal to do a partial rewrite, when it, and when is it ideal to do a ground-up rewrite? Um, a partial rewrite is done when you have, say, a particularly nasty class that has been sticking around for a while and causing problems. Um, a full rewrite is, uh, should be done if you're changing languages or your entire code base is riddled with problems that you don't even know how to begin to solve. Yeah, um, in a similar vein, if you can do a partial rewrite, do it. Um, it's generally preferable. It's easier than it seems to do a partial or an incremental rewrite, and it's harder than it sounds and takes longer than it sounds like it's going to, to do a complete ground up. Uh, I think you can take this one. Uh, oh, uh, I'm not good at working this thing. Nice. Um, someone asked uh, for an example of excessive creati creativity. Um, and this is really difficult to, uh, to explain. Yeah, I think I hit the green smiley and then I hit another thing that said show. Yeah, you only, you only hit the green smiley. Okay. Um, this is uh, something I find a lot of times that literary writing advice 
is very relevant still in programming, especially since programming is such an expressive medium. So the idea here is to kill your darlings. You have something that you're really attached to, but it is too clever and it's causing problems. It's important to recognize when something has too many maybe moving pieces or um, or just doesn't work as well as it does on paper. Maybe it was a great idea, and maybe it just needs more time to cook. Um, Anonymous asks, could you give an example of a code rewrite that you guys have done that follows the aforementioned principles? That's a good one. Um, the one of the mods I have here, um, Wandering Wizardry, it's kind of a rewrite of the mod that I showed off last year, uh, Refined Magic. Um, I decided to go completely from scratch because I messed up a lot of things. And initially, I set a list of everything I wanted in that, in the mod. And I've been working on that for about six months, which is about what I expected. And it's going along very well. Uh, for me, the I had a kind of aha moment at Singularity uh, when I brought Engination in, and it was immediately disqualified for good reason. It did two things, and I thought, why? It doesn't have to. And so making new Engination and making conventional cubes was effectively a full write, a rewrite of each. And I wound up with, instead of one mod that was really hard to maintain, two mods that were actually quite easy. Um. Should you always consider the most generic version of unique mod functionality for API use beforehand? I don't think so. Um, like, you can do things to set up your mod, but if you go too far, you'll get into abstraction hell. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. There's uh, something I didn't go over was uh, dry and wet. Dry is the ultimate expression of this question. Don't repeat yourself. You design something perfectly and write it once. That's also an idea that, that you should modularize, that everything you write, uh, if you find out that you want to repeat yourself, you don't. You split that off into a subroutine instead and, and you use the subroutine. I am a fan of a variant called wet or write everything twice. Where you just write it so that it works. Let's face it, sometimes it's all any of us can manage. <laughs> and when you realize how your code behaves in the real world, you're going to have to rewrite it, at least a little part of it. And at that point, you know what all of the unforeseen consequences are. You can write it right. I like that one, though. Anonymous asks, what do you think of React? It I hate it. Same. I absolutely hate it. 
I I do I've I've touched uh web development with React and it is very painful. I have to say it gets a lot done. Yeah. I don't think I don't think anybody likes React and yet it's everywhere powering everything good. Yeah. Like Minecraft. Well, no one likes the code base, but we still make mods for it. That's true. Um, Anonymous asks, do you have a rule of thumb for how long it should take to do partial rewrites until it's not worth it anymore? Um, That's a tricky one, too. It's especially largely uh, you can go first it, it's going to it's going to be different for everyone unfortunately i hate saying that but i don't have a good one size fits all answer for everyone here um i think it depends on what you're rewriting um if you're rewriting say the code for a block that's obviously going to take much shorter than rewriting a network handler. This also kind of feeds into one of the earlier questions, like where's the cutoff point? And it really becomes like when it's no longer sustainable to do this over and over again. You, you want your rewrite to take less time than your repeated attempts to re remediate the code. Um. Anonymous asks, when are you going to put this software as made with love by a queer per trans person in your mods? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Minecraft rewrite win. Uh, that technically already exists. It's called Bedrock Edition. Yeah, honestly, some of my best mods were written out of spite, so one of the uh, commenters was dead on. Um, Would Java mod devs be able to review Kotlin code, or should I ask Kotlin mod, mod devs? I'm rewriting my mod in Kotlin. Um, I think most Java developers have some level of familiarity with Kotlin, but you should really be asking people that know the domain. Yeah, as a Java developer, um, I do come into contact with Kotlin code. I support Kotlin users for library functions. And I am still very ill prepared to give advice on, let's say, Kotlinic properly written code. Um, how slash where does one ask for rewrites? I'm not really feeling too confident with my code quality. Um, I think one of the best ways to get better at writing code is writing a lot of it. So like, uh, 
starting dumb projects that you know won't get anywhere uh, will really help you learn how to manage your code bases better. Absolutely. Um, I think if, if you want to ask, um, I would probably ask about code reviews rather than rewrites too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just because I don't, I don't ever expect someone to rewrite my code for me. But it would be nice if they could help. Um, is there a good trick to prevent issues from mods and the like, which relied on an API having issues following its rewrite, i.e. after a function of an API and something that relied on that function breaks? Um, if... So you're talking about if, a, making a breaking change to an API because you have to. It largely depends on semantic versioning. If they only bump minor version and the semantic of a function changes, then that's an issue with the API developer, but if they bump a major version, uh, then I think it's fair game. Yeah, I think uh, as developers, maybe we should get in the habit of arranging our sort of FMJs and QMJs to only go up to the next, just under the next major version. I see a lot of just you know, greater than equal to the version that we use, and that's going to get us in trouble. James is absolutely right, and this is my strategy for a lot of the Jenkson breaking changes that have happened over the years, which is pin it to a Minecraft version and make sure mm -hmm. that, that that's well communicated, that people know this version of the mod is for this version of Minecraft, and that version of the mod is for that version and beyond of Minecraft. Good question. Are there things you would advise doing to make code future-proof? That is, to prevent a future rewrite. Unit tests. Unit tests are great. Uh, I would recommend pretty much all of the strategies that we talked about in our talk. Um, I'm going to include some links at the end to help design and um, code flow and things like that. But yeah, well-written and especially clear code that's easy to read is going to be much less at risk of a rewrite. Are there, particu are there any particular ways to practice things like killing your darlings or refraining from rewriting more than necessary? Write a lot of code. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the same thing with As... writing, with creative writing. Killing your darlings, the answer is just to be writing and writing and writing. And every single like individual piece of written word is now less valuable to you because you've written a lot of stuff and you can kind of step back and, and look at your work more impartially. And if you write a lot of code, you'll get better intuition on what needs to be rewritten and what doesn't need to be rewritten. Mm -hmm. Can you mention a rewrite that went badly I can. <laughs> um, Jankson 2.0. It is in development hell right now. Uh, I still love it, but it's going to take some work to bring it out of the uh, shadows there and get it 
really production ready? Um, as I mentioned earlier, Bedrock Edition. <laughs> In a lot of ways, Bedrock's better than Vanilla. It's a much better renderer. Yeah. <laughs> Um, any advice for someone who has to rewrite someone else's ancient code base? Hmm. Um, just figure out the functional. If you if you don't want to familiarize with the yourself with the code base, um, figure out what it does and then implement that yeah i think this comes down to either really careful reading of the code which can be extremely difficult or just playing the mod seeing what it does and doing what it does a lot of times you're going to approach a behavior very differently, especially in a very different version of Minecraft. Yeah, if good your point. Code... Oh. Good point. See if you can evaluate why the original code is so messy too. Um, if your code is too bad or unreadable, is it better to go closed source? No. Um, there are a lot of people that, when they stumble upon bad code, will attempt to help you fix it. So having it be open source allows for that kind of interaction. What we're not saying is that there's no reason to be closed source. There are valid reasons to be closed source, and I'm not knocking anybody for deciding to hide their source. However, don't do it because you're afraid that your code looks bad. I guarantee there's worse. There's worse in the JavaScript ecosystem. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Is even is even, which includes is odd. Oh boy. Which includes is number. Yep. What to do if a performant function implementation would be hard to read? Is it okay to add a commented out readable version? Um I think that with you, if you document how to use the function, that'll be that'll be a lot better than documenting how the function works. I think it's a great idea. I'm not sure if I'm completely sold on it, and I have to warn that sometimes it's just not worth it to have the high performance version of the code in your code base to begin with. Sometimes that can fall under premature optimization, which we do not want to do. If it runs fast mm -hmm. in the this, this simple version, if it runs fast enough, go with the simple readable version, definitely. Mm -hmm. What? Part should developers consider doing first whilst doing a rewrite? Uh, functionality. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would like to think that we covered it good, well in the talk that we did, uh, that we want to think about what our objectives are first, what we want to, functionality we want to reproduce, what our goals are things like that. It's always going to be a planning step. Um,
where are you seeing the boundaries of Minecraft development? Is writing J and I for a C++ physics engine, for instance, could be considered too much? Or are we meant to push the limits of Minecraft's base code? Um, Java, if you can do it in Java, do it in Java. Because it's hard to write code that uses two different languages. Hilariously, I've seen this happen. We've had Havoc Physics in Java. We've had this. Um, I agree it's probably better to stay inside Java if you can, but I don't think that there are limits. Not really. It's just what we are willing to put ourselves through to be, to look amazing. Do you think it's reasonable for an API to completely rewrite its code? Should this wait until the next major Minecraft update, or even then? Um, I think it wants to be a major mod version, just to telegraph to your users very clearly yeah, that yeah. you are changing things in a breaking way. It's It's a very difficult decision to make. I don't think that it's strictly necessary to do over uh, a major Minecraft version, unless you're Quilt. <laughs> um, I just what recently... should I do with Sorry. an arguably unmaintainable code base that I don't feel like rewriting, but also probably should? If you don't want to rewrite and want to put into the effort to maintaining it, that's your choice, ultimately. Well, uh, that's a pickle. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to maintain it. People who tell you so are wrong. You're not obligated for shit with code. The most important unless thing. you're unless it's your job yeah yeah the most important thing is to make your process sustainable because you can't maintain your code if you're not healthy anyway so what if an api is non-existent um then you're free you don't have to worry about about breaking yeah. your API. If you don't have an API, you it doesn't matter what you do. Um my code th this person's code is in JavaScript and it's really bad. And they're thinking of switching to Rust. So they can have cleaner code um that's a fallacy um switching languages won't inherently make your code better um you need to just get better better at writing code in general i would also suggest a possible alternative it's a very short distance from JavaScript to TypeScript, and TypeScript mm -hmm. can give you tools to clean up the existing JavaScript code uh, a lot faster than maybe the Rust rewrite would. Although Rust, I'm not knocking the possibility of a Rust rewrite. That's an entirely possible uh, strategy. Um, you shouldn't switch languages because X language is cleaner than Y yeah. language because that's that's a cause of how you write code. Are game tests actually helpful for Minecraft mods? 
Do they help to find bugs? If yes, what framework should you use for test? Um, Minecraft's built-in test framework is uh, used in QSL, I think, and Quilted Fabric API. I'm not sure about Fabric API, probably, but um, they're good to make sure there aren't any changes in parts of the code base you think are unrelated, because that's what unit tests do. I would say uh, game tests are most important for your integration tests. Your end-to-end -end does do all of these parts work together. I would mm -hmm. highly advise something like JUnit, uh, preferably JUnit Jupyter, to sort of slice off individual pieces of your code and test them individually as well, especially when they break. Uh, this is going to kind of feed into the next question as well. Are unit tests worthwhile when the design might cause more issues than the code clarity? Yeah, a lot of Minecraft mods are hard to test in individual pieces. I would still recommend it if you can. Um, one thing and... that can help aside from JUnit is Makito. You can just make an object and tell it, pretend to be the Minecraft server, and when you're asked this, do this. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry. Um, another good practice is when you're writing out an API, write the unit test first, so you can make the API pass the unit test. Test-driven design. You write the, you stub out the code, let's say, you have a method, and then you write the unit test that verifies that the method works properly before it even works properly. And then you write the method, and then hopefully everything's good. If not, you find out right away before your API users get it. It's really nice. A lot of like top tier shops do things that way. Merchant Pug asks, why rewrite when you can cause problems instead? I'm rebellious, sunglasses. Good point. Mentioning unit tests, when should I start using them? I suppose that's smaller projects. Can someone figure out the how to stop the music? Is there? I have music turned off. Oh, well, that would be a problem. Yeah, 15 is not for music. But, uh, are we good? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um. So uh, mentioning unit tests, when should I start using them? I suppose that smaller projects don't need them for anonymous. I would say the more problems you run into, the more you need unit tests, period. Yeah. Um. Another good thing is if you start getting bug reports that you know the cause of the issue, you can write the unit test to test that bug. So if you ever get a regression, um, that test will catch it. Mm -hmm. A lot of Jankson bugs are closed permanently this way, where there was a a behavior that I didn't anticipate. 
the bug was fixed and a test was written to make sure the bug was fixed. And now every time I push code, the tests run and the system notifies me that the bug was unfixed. Those are fun. Um, Anonymous says, people say if you write comments, your code is not expressive enough, but can help Java doc stuff with future rewrites, or does it have the same problems? Um, documentation and comments are different things. Java docs are great. Comments are sometimes unhelpful. Uh, I know that uh, now my dad is uh, an old database programmer and the first thing that he does is he takes all of the lines with uh, an asterisk in the place where a comment would start and he zaps them. Um, people used to put the asterisks all the way around the comments and they'd call that flower boxing. It is important to develop code literacy. Reading code is a really difficult thing. But at the same time, a Java doc tells you a lot that's not expressible in the code about a contract, for instance, mm -hmm. what the code promises that it will do. It doesn't matter what it does sometimes. The promise is important, like this will never return null you know that future versions will also not return null. Mm -hmm. um, anonymous, uh, if you're working on a big project that will take far too long to do alone, what is the best course of action? Pull it quits find, or find help? If so, how do you find help for the project? Um, if you have friends that do software development most of the time they'd be if they're free though they'd be willing to help you with that project it's a hard problem i would love to have help with jackson <laughs> but can't always be done mm -hmm. if you can find help that's great though i've definitely wound up working with other modders and getting done things that I never would have gotten done myself. Mm -hmm. So you, even outside of just increasing your sort of code velocity, there are additional benefits from taking on other, other helpers. But at the same time, you've got to be wary of adding too many extra hands. Um, there's a joke, uh, what takes one developer one week takes two developers two weeks, which is a bit of an exaggerated example, but it does uh, slow down development if you have too many devs working on it. Yeah, don't expect to uh, gain an instant code velocity change by adding a developer. There are a lot of reasons to add one, but uh, you cannot put nine women in a room and have a baby in a month. That's not always how it works. Um, I thought you <laughs> couldn't use unit tests with Minecraft mode code since it doesn't start Minecraft. Um, there's a game test framework uh, that is hidden in the game code that uh, quilted Fabric API and or Fabric API and Quilt Standard Libraries both have stuff for that you can use. And then outside of the integration tests, I try very hard to stay out of Minecraft entirely. So for instance, if I'm writing an item transfer framework, I should be able to use large portions of the item transfer framework without ever touching Minecraft.
Um, another good thing is a uh, mocking framework. Mocking mm-hmm. being it pretends to be a thing. So you can write your tests around that instead of the real thing. Um, anonymous asks, how to properly debug a Minecraft mod project? Should I really use a debugger when I can use system.out? Um, that's a personal decision. System.out, my love. Um, some people, some people swear by debuggers. Some people, like me, just print to standard out and use that. Um, either works fine. Whatever or... gets you to your problem faster, absolutely. Yeah. The biggest problem, and we've seen it here at BlanketCon, gotta remove those before the mod goes <laughs> into production. <laughs> yeah. You just got to remember to remove them. Um, do you have any examples of mods with unit tests in Quilt? I want to add unit tests to my mod, but couldn't figure it out. Um, I think Aurora's Decorations recently added some tests. Creates a good example, yeah. Um, for a small project, how many developers do you think you'd work nicely? I find two is a nice sweet spot to stop Roblox without overcomplicating. Um, that's also another personal question. You gotta ask yourself what you're comfortable with. As a as a management problem, one person can oversee about seven people max. Over that, it's not going to work. So anything under that, we're good. Any nice features in IntelliJ that you'd recommend to give a try? Um. Gonna leave this to my co-host because I am a uh, Eclipse diehard. Um, if you use the IntelliJ, uh, the one that the 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 uh, JetPrains runtime, I think that supports method addition and deletion with debuggers. Isn't there a yeah. Vineflower plugin now? Uh, there might be. Uh, there's yeah. also the Minecraft development plugin, which is amazing. Um, how would you prevent yourself from getting burnt out while coding? Walk away. Um, yeah. <laughs> Seriously, walk away. If you're getting overwhelmed, step away from the code base for a bit. Look at something that isn't a computer screen, preferably touch like grass. A plant. Touch grass, sure. Sleep, um, hydrate, everything. Just, just do all of the things that make you human again, or or whatever you happen to be. Yeah. Um, that looks like the last of the questions. I'll wait a couple minutes in case any more come in, nope. but... Wait, we got a couple more. Oh. Okay, Aww. just wanted to say I that I appreciate your talk. Very informative. Um, 
thank you. We were working on it, like, right up to the nose. And with that, I think we are, we are yeah. done. Thanks for coming, um, everybody. Yeah, thanks for coming.